Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So um, I know people are anxious to hear your story. As I said off 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 air before we got started, I feel like Grow Bioplastics is really one of the up and coming for sure in, in Knoxville and East Tennessee. But before we get to talking about it, maybe you could share with everyone a little bit about your background and uh, even some personal information. People love to kind of get to know people on a personal level. Sure. So uh, I'm a transplant to Knoxville. I originally grew up in Northeast Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. Okay. Um, I'm unfortunately a Browns fan. It was a great season <laughs> so this you've year. Had a, you've had a rough couple of years, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, dumpster fire is a good representation for this year. <laughs> um, but I grew up there uh, and was always interested in the sciences um, and eventually went to the University of Toledo for my undergrad where I studied chemistry um, and then came to Knoxville for graduate school at the University of Tennessee. And I knew coming into it, um, I had always kind of had this desire to see what it would be like to work for myself, to start something. Um, I was never super enthralled at the aspect of working for somebody else. Maybe it's the millennial in me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I was drawn to the PhD program at the University of Tennessee in the Bredesen Center, right. which is a, an interdisciplinary program where students not only study their disciplinary sciences, mm -hmm. but they're also encouraged to take classes in public policy or entrepreneurship and technology commercialization. Interesting. So, so you, you say that you sort of knew early on that you wanted to work for yourself. Is there particular aspects of that that you were drawn to? When we talk to folks, we hear a variety of reasons. Is there any particular pieces of it that, that you feel like drew you in? Um, you know, I can't say that it's any one individual thing. I, I, it was never really the money. Uh, I know a lot of people say that they want to go work for themselves because they think that it'll make them more money. Sure. And I know, I know lots of people who have small businesses that make the same salary or less than they would at some bigger corporation. A corporation. But, yeah, no, it's very true. I mean, some people, they end up doing better in the corporate world than they would. I mean, it just, so I think that's a great thing for folks listening to, to kind of pay attention to a great tidbit you're already giving them is not always making that decision based on money. Was there other yeah. factors that drew you to it, though? I think the the biggest part for me is um, I've I've wanted the opportunity, and I've had it in some other jobs in the past, to kind of flex my leadership skills. Mm -hmm. um, and I seem to work best when I'm the one who can kind of drive the direction of, of work being done. Sure. And so the, it seemed to just fit best that if, if I had an idea, uh, I've, I've kind of had this internal drive to want to prove to myself that this is something that I'm capable of doing. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. So I hear that a lot, and it's in me too. It's just that need to kind of, you, you don't, you're not necessarily trying to prove it to anybody else. It's just yourself. Can I pull this off? Can I do this? Granted, it's not always you. There's a team behind you, but in a leadership seat, you do feel a large part of responsibility for what happens, good and bad. And so that need to prove things. You kind of also alluded to the idea of if I could use the word control, some level of control, was there some part of it that was sort of controlling your own destiny to an extent? Yeah, I, I do think so too. So I, I was never the greatest student in high school. Um, I, I had a, a, a pretty poor track record of doing well as far as grades go, um, which always seemed to make everybody mad because I, I would go through and never do my homework. <laughs> But I would still I would score kinda, well. <laughs> I would still score well on all my exams. I would be in tip top percentile on standardized exams. Um, and I just knew that there was something missing. I, I wasn't, I don't know if I wasn't being challenged or, or what it was. And so to me, this is like the ultimate challenge is in my professional life. What can I do to really make it, you know, entertaining and also worthwhile to, to put my time into. Sure. What, what, uh, I definitely want to talk about the company and how you, how you founded it, but just while we're talking about it on a personal level, um, what's been the sort of the toughest part of going the, the startup route? Um, right now it's, it's been juggling the fact that I'm still finishing my, my PhD. PhD. It's, a, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of people that I have to kind of appease, uh, myself included. Right. Uh, so it's 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 definitely 
it's challenging. I, I sought out to find a challenge and do it, and it, it's been that. <laughs> and you sure did. <laughs> certainly have, yeah. <laughs> what's what's been the best part of it? Um, I there's just I have a a lot of gratification in the fact that you know we we started from an idea about two years ago, really, and we can go into that in a minute. Yeah, that'd be perfect. Uh, um, and have built that to a point where we still have a whole lot left to do, but have been able to communicate the idea of what we're doing to a broad enough audience and, and raise money from these different pitch competitions yeah. that we participated in around the country. And so they're, re they're recognizing the, the, the idea. And so there's, you're saying there's gratification in the fact that, you know, it sort of went from this, your idea only and now other people are recognizing it and seeing the, seeing the need too. So why don't we use that as a great segue into sort of how you got to this point. So you were at the university, you're going through your PhD, you're, you're in the Bredesen Center you got this entrepreneurial spirit, and so where where's that moment? Because I usually find when I talk to people, there tends to be this one moment when the company springs to life, and you go, "Oh, there it is! I see it! I see that thing!" When do you remember that moment? I do. So I, I when I joined um, the Bredesen Center, the first year that I worked um, as a student, I, I was in a couple different labs uh, as a researcher, and I had taken a class in. The Bredesen Center was an independent study in entrepreneurship. It was one credit hour, and the goal of the class was to find a technology that was at the university or at Oak Ridge National Lab, where a lot of the students in our program do research, um, and see if there's enough behind the technology that you can learn how to put together a business model canvas mm -hmm. and see if there's a, a worthwhile business that you could propose. And at the end of the course, the deliverable was that you have this canvas put together and you give like a a five minute pitch to a panel of investors and just kind of see how they respond. Sure. And and from there I met my current research advisor, Dr. Amit Nascar, who works at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, and he was working on these lignin based plastics. And for those of people listening who don't know what lignin is, Please. it's essentially the glue that holds all plants and trees together. It's what gives them their brown color. Um, and it's the leftovers of the paper making process. The paper companies just want the fibers for paper. Right. Uh, the lignin is they, they just burn it or landfill it. So um, once I had joined that lab and had a little bit of an interest in, you know, could there be some potential business here? Um, I found that interesting. And my co-founder, Jeff, and I, for a follow on class, uh, we decided we wanted to take our first iteration of the business plan and and pitch at the University of Tennessee vault court in vault court, 2000 yeah, yeah 2014 uh, we pitched um, and the concept then was that we would be making uh, 3d printing filaments from lignin um, and it was just an academic exercise at that point but we really wanted to challenge ourselves sure. and we went in and and we won we, we took the first place prize it was yeah, I remember uh, I remember yeah, there was a thousand dollar prize that we split between the four of us as students, um, and at that point it was a little bit of validation. But all of us were super busy and were like, "Well, yeah, we got something, but not yeah, sure still." Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're like, we we all went back to our labs and we, you know, kind of hunkered down, had classes to finish, uh, and so in this year, well, I guess last year, two thousand. What year is it now? 16. 17. 17. Look, I don't even know. <laughs> um, in the fall of 2015, I took a class with Lynn Youngs at the University of oh, Tennessee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, called New Venture Planning. It's uh, one of the entrepreneurship track MBA courses. Um, myself and a few other students from the Bredesen Center came in. And there I, I had this idea of, you know, what if we took a different angle using these materials, this different plastics that we were making um, for some application that where biodegradability was important mm -hmm. and that there could be a high volume use and that there was an equally important impact on the environment because, I don't know, there's an environmentalist thread in me too that sure. wants to do good for the world as well a as... A common thing we're hearing from other people too that we're interviewing, absolutely. So we were looking at the agriculture industry and we saw that there's just this massive amount of plastic that's used um, and these things called plastic mulch films, which mm -hmm. are, if you've seen a strawberry field or a tomato field, they're just covering them. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like trash bags. Um, and also pots and containers and all this stuff. And most of us don't ever know anything about that. We were not 
exposed to that. We go to the grocery store or Whole Foods or whatever, and we pick up this perfect apple, and we're like, oh, that's a great apple, or this is a great tomato, and I'm going to buy it. And they don't have any idea how it got there. Right. And there's a lot of work that goes in from the people who are farming to do this, and they use a lot of materials that they kind of have to use because if they don't, they're not competitive anymore, right. but they're really not very sustainable either. So we saw that as like, that was kind of our light bulb moment. We're like, wow, there's this huge multi-billion dollar industry that's all using this product that is not sustainable. It costs farmers a ton of money every year to physically remove all of this stuff from the field. And then they have to send it to a landfill or if they don't landfill it, they burn it, which is illegal. Right, um, right. But unfortunately, some that's their only option. And so you had your pain point. I mean, at that point, you kind of went, oh, here it is. Here's the pain point that I can go out and solve somehow. At that point, did you know how you were going to solve it or did you have to back into it? No, not yet. So, so at that point, we had the idea. And over the course of that class, um, we went through all the different steps for putting together you know, beyond just a business model canvas, a, a full business plan, um, and to understand how we would do it, what was left to do from like the research angle, um, how we would go about manufacturing this. You know, I, I'm a chemist, but I've, I've had no experience in plastics until I started research here at the university. Sure. Uh, and I know nothing about the manufacturing world. So there was definitely a whole lot of learning that happened. Um, but we learned pretty quick that there's a lot of kind of capacity out there. There are companies who make plastics professionally, even right here in Tennessee, um, and they all do what we needed to do. So throughout the business plan, we learned that we wouldn't have to go out and build some huge facility to do this. We would need to you know, secure the IP, which we're working on, um, and get some R&D done to demonstrate that this would work, and then find partners who could make the materials for us. Right. So, Following the the lean route, I guess, is a best way to describe that. Yeah, no, that's perfect to share. So um, just trying to keep the company as small as you can and, and, as you said, lean as you can and outsourcing some things along the way. Yeah, that's so great. it's it's just the two of us. It's myself and my co-founder, Jeff Beagle, right now. Right. And um, we don't have any other employees yet, and uh, we've been using this time um, – since about February of 2016 um, to refine our business plan and try and look for you know, non-dilutive capital to buy some of the initial equipment we need to test this plastic and, and see if it is biodegradable. Yeah, could, you, a, could you go into that for a second? You mentioned non-dilutive capital, so there may be some people who don't quite follow that. Could you just kind of go into your thought process of why, or maybe even just quickly what, it, what you mean by that, explain it, and then why, why you're going to go that direction? Sure. Um, so since we're really early and uh, we're creating a physical product, there's definitely um, a more money that would be needed up front for us to develop it, to do testing, um, and then physically manufacture it. So the uh, equipment, research and development, all those things all are those sort things, of hard yeah. costs that you're going to have to have on the front end. And I, I learned from this class that I took with Lynn and some other books that you can classify any startup into two categories that also makes sense to people in Silicon Valley, sure. um, that you have software, which everybody knows is, you know, I'm going to make the next great pizza delivery app or something like that. Right. Um, and then hardware, which I initially was like, well, hardware is, yeah, it's a computer or something like that. But hardware is any physical, tangible object. Absolutely. And looking at it from that point, hardware startups need a lot of money to get off the ground. And so we wanted to look for as many ways we could to cut those costs by doing strategic partnerships but also, how could we raise money without giving up any ownership in the company? There you go. And, and that's the idea of non-dilutive capital. Right. And so the non-dilutive route that we were looking at and we had laid out a plan was to find as many of these business plan and pitch competitions within Tennessee and then around the southeast and eventually internationally right. um, that we could participate in and try and compete for essentially grant funding and then use that to apply for bigger grants from the U.S. government. So, so just getting smaller chunks along the way. And you, you've been fortunate. You mentioned winning Vol Court. You've participated in some others as well, I think. And we have. pretty so, well. Yeah, so Vol Court in 2014 was the first one, and that was before this current business model existed. Sure. Um, we had shifted enough that we were fortunate to be able to participate in Vol Court again in 2016. Um, and our, our very first one, I want to give credit where credit's due, we did a two-day 
uh, accelerator called What's the Big Idea? Right. Yep. And yep. Put on by the from, Chamber and Fairview Technology Center and, and all that group. Yep. Right. And um, I think it's coming up again soon. It is. Uh, applications are open right now. <laughs> so um, we participated in that. That was just this two-day crash course of everything we possibly could ever know, tearing our business plan apart and building it back up. And from there, that was the first time we had ever pitched uh, the new idea. And we took that and what we learned for it. And we've been fortunate to participate in, I think, 16 different pitch wow. competitions mm -hmm. over the course of this year. Um, we've won or taken some sort of a cash prize or other prize from 13 of them. Wow. Uh, Congratulations. And, thank you. And um, we've raised just over $70,000. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That was going to be my next question is sort of what did that total up to? And it's not an insignificant sum. I mean, 70000 will fund a, a, a lot of things, at least moving certain milestones along to the next one. And you've Absolutely. got, I, I think you told me before we started recording that you're heading to another competition. Is it tomorrow? Uh, yeah, so one of the competitions that we won was sponsored by the American Farm Bureau Federation. Uh, every year they have a rural entrepreneurship challenge, and um, people who are making impacts in agriculture and uh, rural businesses, very much in the field that we're looking at, can apply. I think there were 350 applications this year, and we were fortunate enough to be in the top four of all those plans for through a few rounds. Wow. So we won $15,000 just for being in the top four. And tomorrow, we're going to Phoenix, um, and we're going to be participating in the finals on Sunday. Um, I don't know when this will air, but it may be after. Sure. Uh, but there's a chance for us to win another $15,000. And the biggest and most important thing to me is that we're going to be presenting in front of all these people who are people who are in the ag industry, people who are farmers, customers who potentially may want to use this product. Absolutely. All the people involved. And it's really the, it's only the second time we've ever had that kind of an audience that's so niche and specific to what we're doing. This is a great thing to pause on. There's so much value that comes out of pitch competitions beyond just, I imagine at this point, you've got it down to science, how to present the company and the idea, right? So you've got that, you're getting in front of investors, you're getting in front of potential clients, you're potentially getting some winnings. There's just all these different things, the validation that comes through it, all these benefits that come of just doing that pretty consistently. I mean, you guys have done a, a bunch at this point, so I bet you have the, the, the presentation itself kind of down to science. Yeah, it's pretty close. You know, every time, I think one of the reasons that I can point to for our success is being that both Jeff and I are in the sciences, we're mm -hmm. relatively good students. So unlike my high school days. <laughs> <laughs> it's evolved. Yeah. Um, I have learned that, you know, I, there's always something else that I have to learn. I don't ever think that what I know is the end all be all. So we've taken feedback from every competition and constantly sought out advice and support from advisors and people familiar with what we're doing um, and kind of worked that in. And we've taken what our very first pitch was like 15 minutes long and still didn't cover everything we wanted. Right. And we've been able to deliver that in as short as three to five minutes, depending on where we're at. Um, and then, yeah, just the, the practicing and the delivery and everything is really kind of brought it to a T where I feel very comfortable going in almost any one of these situations and giving a good pitch. Yeah, plus, um, plus to the success alone adds to the confidence. So that's, that's fantastic. It does. And, you know, there's always a, I always get a little bit of jitters going up. I feel like I need a beer or two first before right, I go right. on stage. Sure. Um, because you never know like who the audience is going to be. It's going to be a little bit different. You know, you could do a bit of reading ahead of time, but if it's people you've never met, you don't quite know. So there's always this, I'm being looked at and judged aspect, but absolutely. once you get over that, um, it's all about just being confident in what you're saying and being able to deliver those messages. And, uh, I really, I really chalk that up to our success, really. Absolutely. Success and lots of practice, I'm sure. Um, was so, so good luck in, in that and, uh, let us know how it Thank goes. We can't wait to hear. So what would you say next steps are beyond sort of doing the competitions and, and those type things? Is there, does there come a point when you, where you feel like you do pull the trigger and start to work for uh, larger amounts of capital? Um, yeah, so there's a, a few opportunities that have come across our desk, and one of them is at Oak Ridge National Lab. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this new program called the Innovation Crossroads, mm -hmm. um, and it's really right where we want to be. We've applied for 
two grants from the government, one from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and one from the National Science Foundation. And those are, again, money that if awarded, we don't have to give up any ownership in the company it's for. Just kind of free money and to an extent, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, to develop the product to the point that we need to have some viability for commercialization in the future. Um, but this program at Oak Ridge is a new one that <clears throat> they've done once at Berkeley Lab in California um, and once at uh, Argonne in Chicago, um, where they invite a group of entrepreneurs to apply and uh, they make five awards. And that award includes a stipend and a pretty big chunk of research dollars over the course of two years to do the work needed to get whatever your technology is ready for the next step and that's bringing it to market. And so <clears throat> we applied for that. Um, we'll find out later in January if we got into it. We've made it to the final seven of okay. the five total. Great. Um, I think that there'll be a, uh, a news release coming out eventually um, about all those teams. Sure. So, so we're super excited there and we're hoping that that kind of gives us that extra boost of R&D capital that we need. Um, so from that money, the, the next major milestones that we have are um, more logistical for the product development of these plastics. We have to demonstrate that I could make more than just you know a little piece at a Absolutely. time. Absolutely, sure. Um, and then we can give a, a big enough quantity to it to our partner um, here in Tennessee who can demonstrate that they can process the plastics on a large scale right. uh, and convert them into these initially these films that we need for farmers. Uh, and then by the summer, if everything works out as planned, we'll hopefully have our first test materials in the ground where we can uh, have them with plants growing around them and you know be comparing those to you know, the industry standard oil-based plastics that are out there right now. Absolutely. Well, it sounds very exciting. Lots going on. It sounds like your first half of this year is going to be uh, pretty monumental. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah. monumental. All of that's it's going to be a, a lot of work to do, and you know, I still have to keep plugging along on my my PhD work as well. Right. Um, right. So, all of that together, uh, I'll I'll be busy, but I I enjoy it. I was going to say you back to keep the idea. You like the challenge, right? So it's, yeah. it's good to it's it's good to stay busy. Um, well, that's a good place to kind of kind of end it. But if you if you have any thoughts on sort of um, if anyone's listening and they're thinking about going this direction, any parting wisdom for someone that's thinking about going the startup route? Um, you know, I I've I found it really really valuable to just constantly ask for everybody's opinion, um, whether you think ahead of time that their opinion would matter or not. Uh, you'll quickly learn that everybody has something to teach you. There's always something that you can learn from somebody else. So whether it's a person that's done it before, whether it's a person that's helped other people do it before, or whether it's you know your parents or your grandma, um, all of those people talking about your ideas to them lets you get kind of the unfettered feedback that's necessary to see if, if not only if what you're doing for an idea is a good um, something good to pursue, but that you personally understand what it'll take and just to go for it. Uh, it's just lots of validation, basically, talking to, yeah. to lots of people and being willing to hear that feedback is tough for a lot of folks because it's, as I always tell Alex Lavage, if you know Alex, you know, it's your baby, right? And when people right. call your baby ugly, it can get really tough, but right. you want to hear those things. I, I, I know my, one of my own startups, I thought I knew exactly what the pain point was because I was in my own target market. And then by talking to some folks that were in that same target market, I found out that there was another pain point I hadn't even thought about because I was so close to the issue. So I think just just talk, it's a great, great piece of advice to leave for everyone. It's just talk to anybody and everybody that will listen, but not just expect for them to tell you what you want to hear. Really sit back and take in the feedback they give you. Even if you think it's just not accurate, you've got to at least listen to it and ponder a little bit on what they're saying. So that's that's fantastic. Absolutely. I think that the, the biggest piece of advice that we were given is to be coachable. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people who decide they want to be entrepreneurs, there's already some level of personality that says, I know what I want to do and I'm going to figure it out and any decision I make is the right one. Because they've got to convince themselves that this otherwise crazy proposition that they're going to you know, stop working on what normally makes them money or provides food for their family right? and then jump in this whole mystery world of can I even build this thing and I have no idea. Um, getting rid of that mindset and 
allowing yourself to get feedback from people especially people that you don't know because that's the most valuable right um, you know your friends and family will probably tell you what you want to hear and it's, it's easy to, it's easy for mom to say great boost, idea <laughs> yeah if you need the confidence boost if you're feeling down go talk to your mom or your grandma they'll right. love you to death they'll right. be like you're the best but when you really need to know whether your idea is good or whether like how to build a team how to raise money find those people who you don't know and then ask and they're probably going to take an interest especially here in the southeast i didn't think that there would be a ton of people in this area because my exposure prior was, oh, everything in entrepreneurship is in California. That's exactly so, why yeah. we're doing the show, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, exactly. it's the future so there's so many going people on. here. There's so many great resources. Um, so just reach out. Shoot an email to somebody you don't know. Ask for a cup of coffee. I've done that a lot of times, and it's been really beneficial. I've gotten some mentors out of it, too. Absolutely. Great, great, great advice. So um, if anyone's interested in learning more, where can they find out more about the company and, and maybe even yourself? Uh, so... If anybody wants to find uh, about the company, they mm -hmm. can. Our website is growbioplastics plural uh, dot co. Mm -hmm. They can find us on Facebook or Twitter. Those same handles, okay. Grow Bioplastics. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me, you can send me an email. I'm just Tony at growbioplastics dot co, uh, or I'm on Facebook and Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn. Twitter and LinkedIn are probably the best ways to get a hold Absolutely. of me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Tony, thank you so much for taking time. We wish you the best of luck in the upcoming pitches. Can't wait to hear more and uh, great advice for everyone. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Tony. Absolutely. Yeah.